right, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in the Pacific Northwest, the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank our uh, very generous sponsors for uh, once again supporting our business and leaders luncheon. I want to thank Portland General Electric. Our presenting sponsor is Columbia Bank and the Boeing Company. Our stakeholder sponsor is Gresham Barlow School District and I want to give a little shout out for all the hoops that they're jumping through to get school started. We appreciate that. And Metro East Community Media, thank you so much for being our media sponsor. We are recording the webinar today. It will be available through the cable channels for Metro East Community Media and also through our chamber website. It does take about 24 hours to get all of that done and to make us all look good. So um, you can re it can be rebroadcasted. You could listen to it again. This is our second Business and Leaders Luncheon this month. The November ballot is full of very important decisions. So we felt it important to double up in September. Today's topic is about one of those very important decisions. There is a, a new tax request from Metro on the November ballot. And the chamber felt that it was important enough to give our members the opportunity to hear both sides of the issue, which is what's gonna to happen today. Measure 2618 is a new tax raising $5 billion by taxing compensation at 0.75%. Initially, only companies with 25 or more will be sending in the tax. However, the tax after the first year could be changed every year to increase. And that's why we wanted folks to listen today to this important matter. And there's no sunset on this tax. Transportation and mobility are very important to a healthy economy. Both sides, I will emphasize that, both sides have very valid points to make. So let's get it started. Speaking on behalf of Metro is our local commissioner, Shirley Craddock. Shirley's been a, a commissioner for what, seven years, Shirley? Is that just one, one more year or two more years left? She, she knows our community, she knows our needs. So commissioner, we're gonna start with you. Let's start with your facts and your proposals supporting the new Metro tax. Thank you very much. Um, Holly, if you could go ahead and load the slide deck, please. Thank, um, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Chamber members, for your interest in Metro Council's Let's Get Moving uh, Transportation Investment Measure that's going to be focusing on safety, transit, and uh, traffic. Uh, this is a measure that um, we have been working on for the last six years, the first four years, updating the regional transportation plan to make sure that every city and county's uh, projects are identified in the, in the regional transportation plan. And then the last two years, uh, an investment um, committee has been shaping that measure for us. So Holly, if you would go on to the next slide, please. So it's, it's more important than ever that we focus on uh, our economy or racial, uh, in this challenging time of economic, racial, and social change, it's more important now than ever that we act on behalf of our communities and invest in our region's safety, mobility, uh, economy, and racial equity. So the Metro Council, as I mentioned, has been focusing on uh, preparing for this plan for more than six years, those first four years, updating the regional transportation plan. And in the last two years, a 35 member task force that was appointed by the Metro Council president to uh, meet and develop the investment plan. They met more than 22 times over a 16 month period. And during that time, we had more than 19,000 community conversations in 11 different languages to do our best to reach out to the entire region to learn what is most important to those that live and work in our region. If you could go on to the next slide, please. Prior to the pandemic, I'm sure all of us would agree that we have a traffic problem in our region. In fact, um, the, the Portland Metro region was identified as being the, um, having the 14th worst traffic in the nation. 
And uh, in addition to that, we expect the region is going to continue to grow over the next 20 years, where over 500,000 people will be moving here. Uh, and so this traffic congestion is not going to go away. In addition to that, uh, between new babies being born and residents moving to the area, we have over 2,000 people every month that are uh, new to the area. Next slide, please. So we got to do something about this congestion. And so the plan is, is to, the plan is divided into two parts. The first part is focusing on 17 connected corridors. Uh, the, re, the decision was made to focus on corridors to, as opposed to what I call one-off projects where you do a, a project here or a project there, but to truly make a difference in some of the most congested corridors in our region. These corridors were selected for a particular reason. First of all, over 60% of the employment occurs along these corridors. Over 62% of the commercial activity is in these corridors. And these are also some of the most unsafe corridors in our region where most of the crashes occur. And as you look at this map, you're obviously recognizing a lot of what they are and very familiar with them. On the east part of the region, there are 82nd Avenue, 122nd Avenue, uh, 162nd, and then creating a new corridor uh, in the, uh, that would connect 181st that connects to Airport Way. And as it moves south, they become <clears throat> 190th, but then build a new corridor that will connection that will connect it back to 172nd in Clackamas County and onto Highway 212 in the Clackamas area. On the west side of the region, I'm, uh, you recognize the Tualatin Valley Highway, 185th, uh, in uh, Highway 99, uh, Highway the 217 corridor, Highway 43 along uh, the Willamette River that connects West Lynn, uh, Lake Oswego, and Portland, and then Highway 99 in the Clackamas County. And then uh, there's multiple projects that are identified in the core of our region in downtown Portland. Next slide, please. So um, the plan is to um, do over 120 miles of new roadway improvements, over 60 miles of new roadway planning uh, in the transportation world. You, there's a, it takes three, uh, you do th uh, three things before you can construct a new road is the planning, the design, and then the construction. And so before a road can even be considered for funding, you have to have that planning done. But then also to add 30 miles of new bus lanes, get our buses out of traffic, to allow them to move through intersections efficiently and effectively, and also then make it easier for um, auto traffic to move through these corridors. And then in addition, be building new transit priority signals. These are the six smart signals that talk to each other that will allow buses to continue through intersections on the green light, but at the same time, allow traffic to move smoothly along these corridors. And then the big project is to build a new max line that will connect Portland with Tigard and Tualatin that follows the I-5 corridor to give relief to the corridor and increase the capacity of that area. Next uh, slide, please. But also the, the major focus is on safety. Uh, we, every year, well in 2018, more than 35 pedestrians were killed in motor vehicle crashes. Uh, or seriously, seriously injured another 500 people. Uh, most of our <clears throat> crashes occur, um, most of our congestion is caused by these crashes. And so, so you improve, make the roads safer, we're also gonna reduce congestion. Next slide, please. But in addition, um, the, the second part of the measure includes uh, focusing on 10 programs. And this is funding that, funding that will be available each year that cities can apply for uh, about $25 million a year. And uh, three of these programs are focusing on safe routes to school, on some of these safety hotspots where some of the most, um, uh, most crashes occur, and then also continuing to build out our walking and biking connections. And so more sidewalk will be built, more crossings will be built, more street lights will be added, and then it will in addition, will continue to add more bikeways. Uh, so as you add, uh, our transportation system uh, is all of these modes and they all are connected together and to have them all working together creates an efficient system throughout the entire region. Next slide, please. 
But most of all, right now, I think what's one of the most important parts of this measure is the value it will bring to our economy. Uh, because of the pandemic and now the challenges with the fire and the impact it's had on our, our jobs, uh, this measure will um, be a big boost to our regional economy. As you think back uh, through our, our country's history on the value of what government can do to help us overcome these challenging times. And by investing in um, these construction projects, it's going to put people to work. But if, when this measure passes, though, it's going to also, though, allow us then to leverage another $2 billion from the federal government that won't be available to us without this measure passing. Um, it, uh, and we also then are, we're careful to exempt as many businesses as we could from this tax. And so more than 91% of local businesses will not be having to pay this tax. We also know that every uh, dollar that we invest in our transportation system, we get $4 back in our economy. So this is, this is good for our economy. Besides reducing our congestion, the challenges we have with traffic, this is a good way to get us back to work. Next slide, please. So the, the, the projects are, um, the staff have been working hard, working uh, with the cities and the counties in the region to make sure that many of this project will be able to begin immediately. And so uh, it's, like I said, it's gonna have an immediate impact on our uh, local economy. Uh, the, we know that this, this measure is going to be building more than $4 billion worth of new construction. That's gonna create more than 37,000 new jobs and jobs that are family wage jobs that are uh, something that you can support your family on. Next slide, please. But we're also gonna be, we're focusing on some of the challenges that we've had our hist his history regarding racism. We know that people of color and low income are people that are more likely to be hit or killed by an automobile while they're walking or bicycling or driving. We know that people uh, of color and low income are people that live in places that aren't adequately served by transit. We know that people of color and low income are more likely to be exposed to the toxic, uh, to the pollution that uh, traffic can create. And we also know that people of color and low income experience much higher risk of asthma and other respiratory problems because of the, the exposure that they have to traffic pollution. Next slide, please. So another group of programs the major is focusing on is um, ma making sure that as we, and these new investments are made that we are not displacing people. We know that transportation improvements uh, can create gentrification. And so there's um, work in, in this major to make sure that we can pair together some of the support that we've already seen from the re uh, region regarding affordable housing. Uh, we're gonna make a student fair affordability and then also anti-displacement strategies. So 60% of the corridors that we identified in those 17 corridors, these are corridors where people of color live. And so we'll be focusing on these strategies to make sure that people aren't being displaced as these new projects are being constructed. Next slide, please. And of course, in another major goal of this is to reduce our impact on our climate and our pollution in, in the Portland metro region. In Oregon, the leading cause of pollution in our uh, state is tr transportation. And so as we are in continuing to improve our transit system, making it a system that gets, is more efficient, more reliable, gets us through traffic better, hopefully more people are gonna choose that system. It also transit increases the capacity and, re, and, is it re, and creates a redundant system. So it allows more um, better mobility throughout the region. It's gonna reduce pollution uh, and, it's going to, and we're also focusing then on how to also have cleaner buses. And so the major is going to move us into bus elect, electric buses and also then create better buses system where buses get buses out of traffic and allow them to move through an intersection uh, more efficiently and effectively, along with automobiles. Next slide, please. So I'm here today to hope that you will, you know, support this measure. Uh, we've worked hard to make sure it's a measure that really meets our region's needs. We've uh, done our best to make sure that it's a measure that is uh, reasonable and 
really will make a difference in helping us reduce the congestion that we expect we'll have again when our economy returns to what it was prior to the pandemic. So I appreciate your interest and your willingness to listen to this today and glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Commissioner. I failed to mention earlier that we will take questions. However, you won't get the answers right now. If you would like, if you have a question for the Commissioner or for our next speaker, please put the question in either the chat box or the Q&A. We will make sure that the appropriate person gets back to you uh, with the answer to that question. I'm sorry I forgot to mention that sooner. So, um, Commissioner was right. She will answer your question just not right this minute. So thank you for that presentation. Surely we appreciate it. Our next speaker, uh, speaking on behalf of the Stop the Metro Wage Tax Pack, is Scott Bruin. He will take the opponent side of this argument. Scott, you've got about 20, 25 minutes to speak as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, um, Gresham Chamber. Really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, thank you, Councilor Craddock. I don't think I've had the pleasure to meet you at meeting, you know, online or on Zoom. So a real honor and pleasure to be on here with you debating this, if, if debate's the right word. So, uh, yeah, my pleasure to be here, and thank you again. Um, let me just start with the top and saying that the coalition that I represent is not anti-transportation. We're not a bunch of no-tax, anti-transportation Luddites or anything like that. In fact, the coalition absolutely supports transportation and a transportation package. But I think the important key to, to start this off with is that it needs to be the right transportation plan at the right, at the, at the right time paid for in the right way. And I'm gonna argue that Metro's proposal that uh, Councilor Craddock outlined today is, is emphatically not it. Um, I think first and foremost, we have to kind of start with the background and the situation, really the 800 pound gorilla, which, was, which is this economy that we're all living through right now. Um, this economy is bad, it's the worst in our lifetimes, it's arguably the worst since the Great Depression. Um, you know, we've recovered a few of the jobless you know, numbers now, but when we when this all started happening earlier this year, we let or 300,000 Oregonians lost their jobs. I mean, just unfathomable amount of Oregonians lost their jobs and, and many, 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 most in fact, continue unemployed. I lost my job of over five years because of the COVID crisis and the economic crisis. My job, my, my wife lost her job of over seven years because of this COVID economic crisis. So it hits really close to home. And Metro itself, because of this economic crisis, had to lay off 40% of their workforce back in March and April. So it's a very significant thing. I'm not an economist. None of us have a crystal ball about when this economy recovers. We don't know if it's two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now as it was with the, with the Great Recession that we had you know, 12 years, 13 years ago. Uh, I just think we have many more questions that we have answers. And I think about the worst thing you can do in a bad economy uh, like we have right now is tax the things that we actually want more of. We want more people working. All of us agree with that. And we all want people earning paychecks. We all agree with that. Well, Metro's tax is going to negatively affect people working and people's wages. Uh, it is regressive. It will hurt. It's going to hurt all of us, going to affect all of us, but it will hurt lower income and, and minimum wage workers the most. Um, I was intrigued with Councilor Craddock's slide where she had, uh, you know, the, the people of color and the low income and, and all, you know, some of the disparities that, you know, no argument for me that they have to go through. But one of the things that was not on that slide as we're talking about the economy is the fact that people of color and low income people are hurt the most in a bad economy. And they're the ones that struggle most when we're not, chronic, we're not creating the jobs that we need to be to come out of that economy, that, that bad economy. Um, I think, you know, uh, Lynn, you hit it off at the, at, the, at the top, but I want to make sure that everybody is very clear on what this tax does and how it's, and how it's set up. Uh, it's one of the things as I've been talking to people that people understand the least, you know, actually what this tax is. So, Lynn, as you rightly said, it is a, up to a 0.75% uh, tax on wages and payroll. It hits, uh, it's not just business, as Metro said, but it hits all organizations of 25 or more. So it hits nonprofits, it hits charitable organizations, it hits churches, it actually even hits organizations that even though they don't have 25 
people in the Portland metropolitan region, their footprint is bigger than that. So imagine, um, for example, the American Heart Association, who has a Portland office and has five or six employees, they too would be responsible for this tax because their larger national footprint is more than 25 people. Um, and, if, you know, it, it basically pulls in all of us. And in fact, the only entity that's not pulled into this that is of size is Metro. Metro exempted themselves from this tax. Um, it raises 5.2 billion, uh, as I think was mentioned early on. So that's what this tax is, is set out to raise. It raises 5.2 billion with this new payroll and wage tax, but it doesn't stop there. It never goes away. It raises 5.2 billion, and then it raises 6.2 billion, and then it raises 10.2 billion. It never goes away. So even after these projects are paid for, this tax becomes a permanent operating fund for Metro to do it, whatever future cancelers want to do with it without the need for any sort of a public vote after this one in November. And I think it's, when we talk about, you know, and, and Lynn, you mentioned this, we talk about it's a payroll and a wage tax, but a Moss Adams report that came out the week before last, Moss Adams is a big downtown CPA firm. Moss Adams indicated that it's more than that. Uh, in fact, what's written in the, the measure that Metro put forth actually includes all compensation. So I don't know if Metro's intent is to use that or not, but according to what people are saying independently, they have the ability to, to, to not only tax wages and payroll, but to tax benefits and health care and dental care and, and any sort of, you know, retirement contributions or any sort of performance pay. So I think, you know, when we talk about wages and payrolls, it's potentially much bigger than that. All right, so we've got this tax, we've got this, you know, at least the initial 5.2 billion that's raised. What do we get for all of that? And, and the counselor did a good job of outlining some of the projects there. Uh, what we get is a list of very small projects, very small transportation projects. We get bike lanes, we get sidewalks, we get dedicated bus lanes, we even get bus passes for students for, for a long time or forever. Uh, but what we really get in this package, and in fact, the vast lion's share of this package is, is as was mentioned, a brand new commuter light rail line that goes from Portland, downtown Southwest Portland, all the way down to the Bridgeport Mall. Metro will spend billions of dollars creating this permanent, you know, steel and concrete train infrastructure at a time when commuting patterns are changing dramatically. Um, we're starting to see more cars on the road because of the economy improving a little bit, or at least because people going back to some of their jobs. I think that's great. But what we're not seeing is, is dramatic. We're not seeing any increase in ridership on the light rail lines. And in fact, over the last several years, we've seen significant downticks in, in the folks that are, you know, in just the demand for, for a light rail system. And I think in this year, when, the, when, when we're talking about putting in the least flexible form of transportation, that is a train, when we're talking about this, yet at the same time we're talking about the changes in downtown because of disease parameters, the changes in commuter demands and appetites, the change in just even downtown as being a place where workers are going to centralize, and that, because of the political unrest, may be changing. I think when we're talking billions of dollars on something that's inflexible like that, we have to, we have to look with, a, with, a, with a, a, a very clear, weary eye. And it's billions of dollars of this package. I mean, it is, again, the vast lion's share. And the other cost of this, and I think the counselor mentioned it kind of indirectly, but the other cost of, of you know, putting a train in there is this. To do that, to put in this inflexible, wide landscape train that they have to put in, they have to tear down, the, you know, Metro's bulldozers under their rights of eminent domain have to tear down hundreds of homes and businesses along the corridor, mostly along Barber Boulevard, uh, to, to put the train in. Um, I'm sure there'll be services to help those people, but I think we also need to look at it with a clear eye and say a lot of those homes, a lot of those businesses are, low in, are from low income folks and they're, and they're small businesses, very small businesses, low margin businesses. Many minorities, many ethnic and racial minorities live in that area. And so that's the cost among many others of this, um, of, of what they're doing here. All right. So if, we're, if that's what we get, if we get, a, if we get a big expensive train from downtown Portland to the Bridgeport Mall, and we get bike lanes and we get uh, bus lanes and all that, and I should actually say just as a side note, um, a lot of the things that they're talking about with these new bus lanes and dedicated bus lanes, they're really not talking about changing the footprint all that much. And so I've heard a lot of talk about McLaughlin Boulevard, and I've heard a lot of talk about TV Highway with this, talking about how they're going to make 
improvements there and, and part of those improvements are going to be, you know, improved sidewalks and, and dedicated bus lines, but they're not really talking about changing the footprint. And so if you're, if you're dedicating bus lanes and yet your footprint is the same, then the, tr <laughs> the ability for cars and commuters and vans and trucks and, and everything else that has to commute actually becomes a little bit constricted. Um, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a physicist and I'm not a geo, you know, architect planner, but I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to understand how we can, uh, you know, improve mobility when we're constricting the space that people get to use. Anyways, that's nevertheless, um, that's, that's what Metro's plan gets you, but what doesn't it get you? What are we, what are we, you know, with this transportation plan of Metro's, what are we not getting? Well, we are not getting significant congestion relief. We are not seeing any impact to commuting times. Um, you know, I, when I work downtown, horrible commute times. When my wife worked downtown, horrible commute times. This plan doesn't change that, um, it, especially if you're somebody that has to be mobile and go to appointments and all those sorts of things. This doesn't change that. This plan doesn't do anything to enhance freight mobility. So if you are, you know, Lynn, with your, with your um, members, those that, you know, have to either manufacture or ship finished goods, their ability to ship into the region or through the region is not in any way enhanced by Metro's plan. It doesn't do a thing for congestion on Highway 26. It doesn't do a thing on I-5, on I-205, or Highway 217. It doesn't do anything with kind of in the back end of the, of the urban growth boundary to, to kind of you know, help, especially manufacturers and, and shippers in those areas uh, uh, deal with the connectivity. And in fact, of this multi-billion dollar plan, I think close to $8 billion when you talk about the federal funds, only 3% based on our economist calculation actually, actually goes to congestion relief. So again, um, it's, it's not to be anti-transportation, in fact, to be very much pro-transportation, it's just this plan doesn't solve the region's biggest problems. So the bottom line is this, in my opinion, we spend billions of dollars on a transportation plan that doesn't solve our problems. We will likely stall efforts because people, you know, once this passed, you know, people's appetite to, to come back to the table is going to be diminished. So we probably stall effective and, and comprehensive transportation efforts for years, if not a decade. And we do this all during this horrible recession and bad economy we're in. We do this all at the cost of a permanent, not a temporary, but a permanent tax on people's wages and payrolls and paychecks. It's the worst possible tax at the worst possible time. And I urge all of your members, Lynn, to strongly oppose this faulty measure. Thank you. I on purpose mute myself so that I don't cough or interrupt and then I forget to unmute myself. I, I apologize for that. So thank you, Scott, for um, giving the opposite side of a very important issue. So um, uh, Commissioner, you're probably taking lots and lots of notes about things you'd like to debate back and forth about, but rather than a debate, um, I would like to ask you a question and Scott did bring it up, but I have it written down ahead of time that um, considering the extraordinarily um, the, the extraordinary financial burdens that businesses and families are going through due to the pandemic, and not knowing when those uh, extraordinary circumstances will subside, why the largest tax in Portland history now? And Scott, after um, the commissioners answered, if not now, then when, Commissioner? Well, I'll go back backwards. First of all, we've been planning this for six years. And so this was a target date that we had established to approach the region on requesting their support. And so unfortunately, these challenges have come along on the pandemic. And then of course, now the challenges that we have with the impact the fires have had on our economy. But when, so they've unfortunately have all appeared at the same time. And so this, these plans, you don't, put out overnight. You, you have to carefully work with the entire region and the 23 cities and the three counties and, and that's why it took so long to put together. But to go backwards though, to think about what the role of government ha plays in our, in our country, um, this is the right time to invest in construction projects and putting people to work. When you look back at the challenging times our country has had, uh, think about the New Deal uh, during the and, and uh, to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009. Government invests in 
um, trans in construction projects and in our uh, uh, building things in our country when our country is in a downturn, because we know that those investments put people back to work. So this measure is not only a measure that will begin to uh, focus on, we'll be focusing on our transportation system, but it's a measure that's going to definitely put people back to work. So this is a measure that really will make a difference and help bring, be able to pull us out of this challenging time that we have with our economy. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Scott, if not now, then when? Yeah. Um, and let me, let me, can, do you mind if, I mean, I'll answer that, but let me, can I kind of also respond to how the, to the points that the commissioner made, to the councilor made? A little bit. Okay. <laughs> Not a debate. <laughs> well, I just want to say, I just want to say, I, I, I applaud Metro because they did do extensive community outreach uh, when they were going through this long, exhausting process. They had communities of color at the table. I have, I mean, I've been saying all along, uh, you know, no, no argument for me. What they didn't have at the table was, and I, 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 I know this because people in this community, you know, in, I should say the community I'm going to describe have told me, they haven't, they didn't really have people, what I would call the freight, uh, you know, the traded sector industry, the ones that are really concerned most with freight mobility. So they weren't at the table. And also when, who wasn't at the table was anybody when they decided how to pay for this. One thing to talk about the projects, it's a different thing to talk about how we're going to pay for this. And when Metro decided, you know, now, th now at that point, we're, COVID and the economy have already cratered. Uh, nobody was at the table, you know, kind of answering that question. So, I mean, I think we just want to be clear on that. Um, if not now, when? Um, not during the worst recession of our lives. Let's give this, let's give ourselves a vaccine at least um, to see how things are going. And hopefully that's this year. I mean, I'll, I'll be first in line to get that vaccine when it happens. So hopefully this year, I think going into next year after we defeat this port, this you know, bad measure. I think it gives us, it gives the ability to have everybody at the table, including business at the table in a big way. If, 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 if this passes, then what Metro has learned is that business doesn't need to be at the table. And I think it's imperative that business is at the table as we talk about how we're going to do a comprehensive transportation plan. So I would say as early as next year, Lynn, hopefully in conjunction with the legislative session, hopefully in conjunction with much better understanding of where our economy is going, and hopefully in conjunction with conversations that actually solve the problems of transportation, as I outlined earlier, I-5, oh, you know, 205, 217, all of those. Okay, you didn't give me an exact date, but you gave me a round about. <laughs> I appreciate that, Scott. I, After Commissioner, the election. Um, yeah. <laughs> Commissioner, I have um, a, just a side question. From the pandemic, we, we've learned that we shouldn't go on to the buses, I mean, they haven't been able to keep us protected on mass transit because of the pandemic. Now, I don't expect a, another pandemic any time in the future, but it could happen. And so we're spending a lot of time and money on a situation that is not healthy under certain circumstances. Um, it did, is, was there any discussion about that since, um, since the Metro councilors have passed this, did you go back and think, okay, maybe, maybe we should dedicate more, more per, a higher percentage of this to um, different kinds of congestion solutions? No, we haven't had a specific question. Uh, TriMet has been putting a lot of, um, you know, wor effort work into this to make sure the buses and the trains are safe. Uh, and uh, I, I, they're figuring it out. You know, we know that the medical community definitely has figured this out. There's ways that we can protect ourselves. And so I know TriMed has put a lot of those same measures into place. Uh, so that will probably likely be um, a, a routine, a, a, a habit that we all will be using in the future is you wear face masks, you make sure you wash your hands regularly, you uh, desanitize, uh, sanitize, uh, these um, public spaces as often as you can, because uh, this is something that's going. We're going to have a challenge with forever, and I think we've we've had we've learned a good lesson, and I think a lot of those practices will continue uh, as we pull out of this pandemic. Okay, well, thank you, Commissioner. So, Scott, I have a question for you now, and then uh, one similar to the Commissioner. 
businesses need an answer to congestion. Moving product and moving customers and employees is critical. Uh, it is critically important. So if not this plan, then what ideas do you have that businesses could support? Well, again, again it goes to, I mean, that's a great question, Lynn. It goes back to what I said. There, it needs to be a plan, right, and a, and a, and a method of funding that is equitable and, and uh, makes sense for all economy, economic situations, not just during a, a, a recession, but a plan that solves, we've got to get after I-5, We've got to get after 205. We've got to get after 217. We've got to get after 26. We've got to improve, as I mentioned earlier, in the in the you know kind of in the outskirts of the urban growth boundary, the connectivity. It's got to be a plan that that does that. And the risk of what Metro is doing here is that if if this passes, a plan that doesn't affect those real issues at all, then I suspect, based on I mean, we've all had political lives and we know how these things work. I suspect that by passing that, we get into a situation where we can't get to the real solutions for years, especially if the business community who isn't, I mean, the business community in one way, shape or form is going to have to pay the lion's share of however we do this. Whatever, whatever the transportation plan is, a big part of it is going to be paid by the, tra- by the, by the business community. So if the business community is, and, and the business community has been almost a hundred percent, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, but massively opposed to this plan, the way it has come together. If this passes over the, over the very strong unified voice of, of business throughout the region, then our ability to get to a plan that business actually supports moving forward is greatly diminished. Um, Scott, I could be wrong in my uh, understanding, but I believe that the major road improvements are funded on the state level and not on the metro level, um, so metro has a oh. little bit of uh, restricted. Not a little bit; they're restricted in what kind of improvements they can make. Is that correct? There's no question. Which raises the question: Should metro be the one doing this? And that's not what I want to debate. And that's not what this you know this forum is for. But no, you're absolutely right. When we're talking about I five and two seventeen and whatnot, it is absolutely a state or and or a state and federal sort of solution as we do this. But the point is, if we spend this massive amount of money, particularly targeting the core area of where businesses operate, so the the core group of people who have to pay for this, whether it's on a local ba- regional basis or a statewide basis, then our ability to get those people to the table, the ability to get people together in Salem to come up with a comprehensive transportation solution that actually works on freight mobility and works on congestion and works on commute times. It's just, it's going to be a, a huge mountain to climb that, that we're, I mean, we're, we're creating these barriers for ourselves that we don't need to do in my opinion. <clears throat> well, um, Lynn, I appreciate your comment. Um, the roads the, that Scott is referring to, yes, are owned and offered by ODOT. And so it, it's the state system that you're, he's referring to. Metro is responsible for the arterial systems. However, we are working with ODOT right now. We're working with the counties. We're working with the cities in the region to look at the future of what we're going to do about congestion management. And so as you probably already know, ODOT is already, the state legislature gave direction to ODOT to focus on what they might do uh, if if they were going to consider a tolling project on our um, state system. And so that is occurring simultaneously along with this measure. It's going to take both of these initiatives to really begin to manage congestion in our region. So yes, this project, this measure is not to, won't solve every problem that we have, but it sure contributes and gets us to the next step in being able to manage and improve congestion on our roads and highways. So I want to continue with this line of questioning. Um, uh, So according to the website, Get Moving website, um, which is pro the pro metro tax, this new measure is going to fund 45 miles of new sidewalks and 140 miles of new bike lanes. And it sounds like there's not going to be any congestion on bike lanes and sidewalks but we still have congestion on the road. So um, you briefly describe what those improvements might look like, but we, we still need to move product and we still need to get customers into the stores and they still need to have transportation somehow to carry the product they bought at the stores out of the stores. So what, what improvements, what do you envision those improvements might look like that actually do 
health congestion in in our region? Well, it, it's when you so we're focusing on arterials and think about when you're traveling an arterial, the most significant the congestion is created by the signaling system, and so every signal you get to, I've had people challenge me about uh, how fast they want to be able to go on an arterial. And think about how often that you will be on an arterial that's two lanes in each direction and if somebody passes you and you end up meeting them at the next signal. And so it's the signals that really are where all the, the, that a lot of the congestion is created. So by focusing on our signaling system, it's going to allow traffic to move through these corridors more efficiently and effectively. And the, when the signals are talking to each other and allowing the traffic to keep moving, when they sense um, traffic, it's also then to allow buses, to get buses out of traffic lanes. Your comment about um, buses and traffic lanes. So there are plans that I, at specific intersections where there's significant congestion, that it, there will be, the buses will have a separate lane. They will be able to move to the right to uh, and pull in and, and, and then when the signal, if they're caught at the signal, they'll be able to leave that, um, go through that intersection first and be able to move on their way and get out of traffic. But it, it's not a new lane, it's a dedicated lane that currently exists. Is that how I understand it? Okay. Some intersections will have new lanes, additional oh, lanes okay. for the buses, yes. Okay, all right, that's interesting. All right, um, I have exhausted my questions that I wrote down and I've got a whole lot of them in my head that I would like to ask. But, but one of the questions that I just saw come through, they're concerned about the changes that potentially could be made. Um, Commissioner, um, Scott brought it up and perhaps you would like to address it. It's my understanding as I read both of both resolutions that after the first year, the tax could go up. Um, currently it starts at 0.75%. And it also could, um, affect a different level of business and it not just stay at the 25 employee and that's in large part because when an elected body does something they should not or cannot impact future elected bodies to make changes in the decision based on whatever the new circumstances are so um it, are, is there is there something that either that you could do or recommendations you could make or what, what is your projection of how soon a business of 10 might have to pay the tax because of the need or because of the costs that have gone up? Because the measure is written that, um, or the resolution is written that based on what the cost needs are is how they will, how future commissioners will be able to adjust the percentage of tax that is, is there. And Scott, I, the reverse is true with you. What, what level are you recommending or what other kinds of fees or tax suggestions or whatever would be necessary to fill the gap, if you will, for, for future needs? Are you asking me first? Um, I, uh, this is what I know, and I don't know where this, that kind of uh, thinking has come from, but what is in the measure is what the Metro Council has to follow. So if the, it's capped at 1.75, we would have to go back to the voters to change that. So we, I don't, we will not have that ability to, to flex that. And now I, I'm not an, a specialist in uh, how measures are designed, but that from my experience, I'll be on the Metro Council for 10 years, we do not. Uh, have that flexibility. And so I don't think the region has to be concerned that we're going to raise the tax or chain or, or then begin to impact businesses that are less than 25 employees without going back to the voters for their support. Well, the, the measure specifically says that with the exception of the first year, the tax could be raised, the tax could be changed, I should say. And my experience, the government never lowers the tax. They always increase the tax, but that's my experience. So um, well, we've had conversations that we would start out, we, the, mag, the top is 0.75, but we have had conversations that because of the economy and the challenges that the pandemic has brought to our uh, region, that we start off with a lower tax initially. The cap would still be at 0.75. 
Okay, well, thank you. And Scott, what are what are some of your funding suggestions? Um, well, what do you anticipate? I mean, Lynn, I appreciate the question, but that's not, that really isn't the, I mean, respectfully, that's not the question. I mean, what's in front of us is Metro's plan and proposal. And what, what our side is doing is, is arguing why this is not the, it's the wrong plan at the wrong time. Um, and we, we outlay the reasons why. As far as what, you know, the transportation plan that we should all follow looks like, Oh my gosh, I mean, I have a million ideas, probably like everybody else on this webinar has a million ideas. Our only point is we've got to get to a point where we can have those conversations beginning next year with everybody at the table, with the big group that, that Metro had at the table for their conversations, as well as the business community and the traded second traded sector industry um, that, that weren't at the table, frankly, as Metro was putting this together. So what is what does the funding mechanism look like for that? What is the, you know, how, how will it be done? How will it be paid for? I don't, I, you know, it's, this is not the time. We, we can have those conversations when we are able to defeat, you know, in November when we defeat this bad measure, but we really can't even talk about that yet because we've got this as I mentioned earlier, this 800 pound gorilla that we've got uh, that, that's staring us down. And, you know, and I, I'm, you know, I'm just going back to the last point of conversation, Lynn. I mean, Metro, you know, Metro says that, um, you know, it's for 25 and more. And then they say, hey, we're only going to charge 0.6. But what it actually says in the measure they passed is, is not that. They actually say they're only going to tax wages, but what's in the measure is all compensation. And so, you know, we've got to be uh, very careful about this. Um, you know, you, you kind of hit on it, Lynn, but it's, it's, you know, the closest thing to eternal life you're going to get is a tax like Metro wants to put in front of us in November. I'll just I, restate um, what the measure says is what we have to do. And so we, there are no plans to put, to be taxing uh, compensation. So it's, we are, by law, are, that is our limitation on what is in the measure. And uh, so I, I think that's uh, misleading uh, to say that we are going to go outside what the measure is, how the measure states. It's, that's our legal, uh, op deal, that's, we have to follow. We have to, those, that's what yeah. the law does. Can I, can I comment on that, Lynn? Again, this isn't a debate back and forth. <laughs> Was that a no? Okay. Yeah, well, no, go ahead. Just oh, okay. Well, I would, say that, I would only say that, and we, we've seen how these things get written. I, my, my guess is that, that when Metro had its, you know, the, the, I mean, you know, Commissioner Craddock didn't sit and pen this, you know, nor did, nor did Commissioner Peterson. That's not what their role. Their role is to lay out the outlines and then the, the, the bill writers, if you will, you know, the, the, the lawyers put everything on the table. And as we understand it from Moss Adams, everything went on is in the table on, on this measure. So while it certainly may be the intent of, or, or I should say differently, certainly may not be the intent of Commissioner Craddock or the Metro Council to tax all benefits or to, to go above you know, a certain tax level or to go below a certain employee level, it's in the measure itself. And so, that, so, so once this election happens and once it's put into permanent law uh, through this ballot measure, then who's to say what happens in the future? They, they, they may say they don't wanna do that, but the law itself gives them the ability to do that. And that's what I'm trying to push back or try at least you know, educate people on. Oh, it's all in the words then. So I think it's very misleading. Yeah. yeah, misleading could be. Um, thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting, Scott, that you kept bringing up the the 300 pound gorilla, and that is how Metro started. They started with the zoo, and so it's very appropriate that you would bring up the roots of what Metro started to be. Um, that the animals in the zoo. So, and that was supposed to be funny, and I guess it wasn't that funny. But you got the weight wrong. I, you said three hundred. It's an eight hundred pound gorilla. So, I want to thank um, uh, Commissioner Craddock. He did again a wonderful job explaining um, uh, your feet on the ground, holding firm with what you believe in and what uh, you think is right for our area, and uh, not only the entire metro area, but the area that you represent, which is our backyard. And Scott, I want to thank you for coming on and doing uh, the job of representing the opposing side on this issue. We have um, the, the Government Affairs Council has made a recommendation. You can go online and see what that recommendation is. And if you, um, as viewers, want to see this again or want to share with your um, the people in your office or other businesses, be sure and let them know that in 24 hours, this could be rebroadcast and it will be on our website and also on Metro East Community Media's, um, uh, their broadcast channels. 
So I want to thank again Columbia Bank, Portland General Electric, the Bowling Company, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community for sponsoring this Business and Leaders Luncheon, our second for the month. We have another Business and Leaders Luncheon scheduled for October, and it's based on another very important issue that we are living through right now and will forever and have forever. The Business and Leaders Luncheon topic next month is e Economics, Black Leadership. We're excited to have three speakers. Speaking on economics and schools will be Dr. Al McCorders, who is the Vice President of Instruction at Mount Hood Community College. Commissioner Craddock, I'm not sure you've met him yet. He's a delightful man, um, has a lot of, of background in the technical um, end of, of instruction. Speaking on economics and running for office, why would you run for office in this economic environment? What can you do and help the economy? Speaking on economics and running for office will be Mingus Maps. He's a candidate for the Portland City Commissioner. Now, why would I get a Portland City Commissioner to address the Gresham Chamber? Well, it's because what happens in Portland affects our local region. So he's going to speak on economics and running for office. And the third speaker, is speaking on economics and small business. And his name is Travis Stovall. He's the owner of EREP. We use EREP every year for our Leadership Academy class. And it, it's a wonderful tool uh, for, your, for your companies. It actually has helped a few marriages as well. EREP, you should look <laughs> it up. I, I haven't used it for my marriage, but I'm just letting you know that what he does is wonderful too. All three speakers are leaders and they're men of color. So please join us to hear about economics from our black leaders on the Business and Leaders Luncheon, October 20th on Tuesday. So again, check out our website and our newsletter for any election recommendations that the chamber has already um, decided upon and made. Again, thank you, Scott, and thank you, Shirley, for your generous use of your time today and in your preparation for today's luncheon. Thank you both. And with that, I bid you adieu. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.